So if you're interested, I want to offer you one last chapter in this discussion of surrealism, and that's the fashion chapter. So you're looking at a photograph by Man Ray of the couturier Elsa Scaparelli, and she is a really fascinating figure who um, was hugely famous uh, in her own time in the 1930s. Um, very well known, but has very much faded into obscurity because um, her business really didn't survive World War II. Um, And, you know, she was around, she was making, making things, you know, through the 1960s, but her house had really, um, had really gone away. Um, And other contemporaries like Chanel, who managed to relaunch their, their brands in the post-war period, um, kind of eclipsed her, but I actually think her work is far more interesting uh, than Chanel's um, and is really very much in tune with the ideas that the Surrealists were working with. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about her. In the photograph, you see that it uses this technique that Man Ray developed called solarization, where you know you get these kind of interesting highlights and things. And these are just techniques that like he discovered by chance in his dark room, screwing things up and then screwing things up on purpose. But if you look at the dress that she's wearing, <clears throat> she's got this feather cape on and this dress that looks like it has pleats in the front, but those pleats are actually painted on. There are this technique called trompe l'oeil. We talked about this a little bit when we talked about cubism, right? The idea of tricking the eye. Um, and these were painted by uh, another artist, Jean Dunant, who was a, a decorative artist um, and uh, very also very prominent uh, designer in the 20s and 30s. Um, and so there's this element of ambiguity and the uncanny in this dress so that the viewer who's looking at the woman in the dress doesn't know if those pleats are real or not until they get really close to the dress. So a lot of Scaparelli's garments like to play with the uncanny and tricking the eye in different ways. These are photographs that were made by Man Ray that were published in um, Minotaur, which was one of the surrealist journals in a 1933 issue. And they were published alongside an essay by Tristan Zara, who you remember we talked about with the Dadaists, um, called Dune Sochan Automatisme du Goût, A Certain Automatism of Taste. And they were used to illustrate this argument that Zara had that um, the subconscious bubbled up in these unexpected ways um, through um, everyday objects. And the examples that he used were hats, women's hats and architecture. And so his claim was that the hats in these photographs by Man Ray were these unconscious images uh, that were sexual in nature, right? So the kind of phallic and labial nature of these photographs was entirely unconscious. That was the argument that Zara was making. But here's the thing. These three hats were all designed by Elsa Scaparelli, who was deeply engaged with surrealism. So the sexuality that's a part of these hats was not subconscious at all. It was totally conscious. This is exactly what Scaparelli was playing with in many of her designs. If you look at Man Ray's mode of photographing them, you can see how he uses the camera to kind of play this up, right? So particularly on the hat on the left, which was a design called Savile Row, Scaparelli used that name to refer to the kind of menswear style of this fedora that she made for women. You can see it's pulled down rather tight on the head of the wearer, which is completely obscured because of the angle that Man Ray has photographed it at. And the image seems to protrude out of the frame at us. So even as you got these sort of folds of the crown of the hat, that give a sense of uh, a labia. You also have this projection outward from the frame of the photograph, which gives it this uh, read of um, being like a phallus, right? So it has this ambiguity of being both feminine and masculine at the same time. But if we look at some of Scaparelli's other designs, it's really clear that she's very much thinking in these terms already. She doesn't need the surrealist to like disrupt, discover this for her. The other interesting thing to me is that these photographs in Minotaur are not credited, the designs are not credited to Scaparelli. She's not mentioned anywhere in the magazine. And in fact, 
in most publications, art historical publications, where you see these photographs referred to, and the one of the fedora hat is is rather famous, Scaparelli is never mentioned, or at least almost never mentioned and credited. It's, you know, Dillis Blum, uh, the uh, curator at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, fashion curator, who um, credits these to Scaparelli among a very few sources. Uh, but in any case, as these photographs show you, including one by Man Ray of Scaparelli, this was a very popular hat, this style, which was called the Mad Cap. Um, and in fact, it was so popular that um, it was being knocked off by other designers and makers. So Scaparelli ordered every single Mad Cap in her warehouse to be destroyed because she was so sick of seeing them um, on the street and being copied by other people. Uh, so... I think any, particularly any woman who would have been looking at this issue of Minotaur would have known that these were Scaparelli hats, even though they were uncredited. One of the things that Scaparelli really liked to play with in her designs always was this kind of conflation of masculine and feminine elements. So on the left-hand side, you can see a suit by Scaparelli illustrated by uh, Cecil Beaton from 1935, where you have a kind of military style jacket but that's then paired with these lacy cuffs and collar. And you can see um, at the on the blouse, there is a little uh, heart doodle design, like a little girl might draw. So there are these elements of masculine tailoring, uh, but also kind of uh, traditionally feminine uh, touches. So always kind of mixing and blending these things. Um, the photograph by Man Ray that I showed you earlier of Scaparelli posing behind that sculpture, here you can see the origin of what was on her head, which were these lacquered uh, helmets that she had designed, or lacquered wigs, uh, by uh, the hairdresser Antoine. And these were what she wore while she was skiing instead of a ski helmet or a hat. Uh, so it was this sort of hair that was like lacquered uh, to create this cap. And you can see on the top image, she had one that was in a darker color uh, for skiing. And then she had one that was silver that she would wear with her evening clothes uh, at whatever ski resort she was at. So this is really a uh, strange and uncanny garment, right? Where you've got hair that is a wig and then also is lacquered. So it's hard. Um, it's a hard surface instead of being soft, what we would expect hair to be. So it's really, again, playing with the viewer's expectation in this very surrealist way. And there you have the original photograph that I was talking about. So you can see that lacquered wig a little bit more closely. So Scaparelli's designs really um, were along the lines of many other designers in the 1930s who were kind of moving away from the flapper silhouette that you see um, on Joan Crawford on the right hand side, um, that uh, kind of boyish silhouette um, the short skirts, the um, cloche hats um, on the right-hand side. And then on the left, you see the same actress, Joan Crawford, dressed in a Scaparelli suit. Um, and you can see that this suit is quite different. It has these very strong tailored shoulders uh, nipped in waist, as opposed to that sort of straight up and down silhouette of the 20s, and a longer skirt. So it's a more kind of architectural silhouette in a sense, I think is one of the best ways to describe it. And it plays with this kind of hard and soft uh, a lot of the times. So we looked at Merritt Oppenheim briefly before. I wanted to show you a few of her other works um, by way of showing you some other possible places where I think she may have collaborated with Elsa Scaparelli. And you can see just from this selection of works that she's clearly interested in fashion, especially accessories. So we've got shoes and gloves and hats here. And uh, a few of these objects, like the fur gloves with wooden fingers or her uh, work, uh, My Gouvernante, My Nurse, Mein Kindermachen, which is this pair of shoes trussed up and served like a turkey on a platter, very reminiscent of the Lee Miller photograph we looked at. Um, were realized, you know, so they were they were made objects. But there are many, like the shoe with fur on the bottom left, that existed in a sketch and were only later, sometimes at, towards the end of Oppenheim's life, um, or even after her death, made into objects. And she um, 
made many, many, many sketches of these accessories like this amazing um, dog hat um, on the bottom right. And it's not clear whether these sketches were sold to Scaparelli, but I do think it's worth acknowledging the similarity between some of the accessories that we see from Scaparelli and some of these sketches. So, um, for example, here we're seeing this amazing wildcat coat and hat by Scaparelli. On the right hand side, you can see uh, a leopard hat uh, that Scaparelli is wearing herself in this photograph. So all of these garments, whether or not Oppenheim designed them for Scaparelli or whether both of these women were just sort of thinking on the same wavelength, which is entirely possible, I think play with this image of the femme fatale, but also the femme enfant. So the femme fatale being this kind of deadly woman uh, who lures men in with her seductive sexuality and then kills them, right? So the huntress. So the wildcat ensemble, you know, is this the coat of a huntress who has hunted her prey and is now wearing it? Or is the woman turning into the animal, which is more the sort of femme enfant side of the equation, the woman child, the sort of woman who is more primitive, who is more animal than the man and who is thus connected with her, um, her subconscious in a different way, um, more connected with her subconscious, according to the surrealists. So what both Scaparelli and Merritt Oppenheim seem to be dealing with in a lot of their work is toying with and critiquing these images, these stereotypical images of women. And because both of them, or, you know, even if it's just Oppenheim, you know, and Scaparelli is producing them, they're both creating these accessories, things like gloves with fur on them that look like the furry hands of an animal that get taken off frequently, right? You take off a hat, you take off a coat, you take off gloves. There's this kind of performativity about these accessories. And it suggests to me at least that there's a sort of performance that's going on of femininity. And so these, these accessories are sort of poking fun at this idea um, that women are constructed as being like wild, like animals or, you know, that they're these sort of deadly creatures. Um, for instance, uh, more hats. Here you have animal faces sort of perched on top of women's heads from Scaparelli. Um, monkey fur, which looks quite a lot like hair and creates these very uncanny images um, that can be worn on the body, uh, on shoes, on coats, on hats. Um, but also even claws that would come off because they're attached to gloves. So this this playful approach um, and this sense that, you know, women are sort of performing their gender, this idea of gender as a performance. And what's really interesting here is that in the 1930s, you have a female psychoanalyst, Joan Riviere, who actually writes an essay called Womanliness as Masquerade. And I'm sorry, it's actually 1929 when she publishes it, which is totally remarkable. And in that essay, she really is, she isn't going as far as Judith Butler will eventually go as she discusses the ways in which we perform our genders, but she's, she's going pretty far in that direction. And I think we see the same ideas being explored by Elsa Scaparelli and Merritt Oppenheim of the ways in which women sort of perform these different roles and are put into these different boxes. But both Scaparelli and Oppenheim, by embodying these in accessories, suggest that these are not real. These are theatrical. These can be put on and taken off um, like gloves. Um, and so they're, they're poking fun um, and really critiquing these ideas, these constructions that, this, that the surrealist men create for women um, and exposing their fraudulence, uh, their, their, their fakery, um, and that these are not, these are not real things, uh, that these are, just, these are just stereotypes in a sense. And there's a few other garments like this pair of uh, leather gloves on the right hand side with veins on them that I think probably 
were designed by Oppenheim for Scaparelli because there is a passage in Scaparelli's autobiography where she talks about gloves with veins on them. Um, so I think these were probably designed by Oppenheim for Scaparelli. Again, it's really hard to trace, but I just wanted to show you some more examples of these kinds of accessories that play with the uncanny, that play with the connection between the body and clothing and sort of blurring the line between the body and the clothes. Also these great gloves with the snakeskin nails that like a bazillion designers have knocked off. Scaparelli, as far as I know, got there first, although I wouldn't swear on it because lots of times you can find an earlier precedent, but certainly the other designers who ripped this style off are not original. So let's give, give props where it's due. Um, those gloves, both those pairs of gloves came from this collection in which there was a collaboration between Scaparelli and Salvador Dali. They collaborated several times. Um, in this collection, there was a group of suits that had um, these sort of bureau drawer pockets on them. Scaparelli loved pockets. She was like obsessed with pockets. And you can see here that this image of drawers coming out of a minotaur in this case, this is a recurring image on, in Dali's work. Um, and he used these drawers as, as ways of sort of referencing the kind of unconscious, right? The stuff in your drawers in his visual world was the stuff in your subconscious. So you can see Scaparelli using that imagery in this collection. And you can see actually the model in this Cecil Beaton photograph is holding the, this copy of Minotaur, this, this surrealist journal. So there's that really uh, significant connection there. And of course, again, this is 1936, same year as that MoMA exhibition. So Dali's doing his shop windows in New York at the same time. So surrealism is really kind of hitting popular culture, at least in the US in 1936. Um, so there you can see on the top right, uh, Scaparelli and Dali together, and you can see this amazing skirt that Scaparelli is wearing in her constellation pin. One of the other uh, uh, things that they collaborated on was this uh, very well-known high heel hat, and you can see Gala Dali, um, Dali's eventual wife. Um, wearing that, uh, looking at a sculpture of Dali's that is also wearing the hat. Um, and it would be really easy to just kind of pigeonhole, and lots of people have, uh, Scaparelli as just sort of um, capitalizing on the interest in surrealism popularly um, and just these, that these collaborations were the only uh, surrealist elements of her work. But I hope I've shown you at this point that, you know, she was very much engaged with these surrealist ideas even before she started collaborating, <coughs> collaborating, pardon me, with artists like Oppenheim and Dali. So this was very much a part of her aesthetic already. Um, and it just gets kind of magnified when she works with surrealists. So Dali, the idea really that Dali had was just like, what if you put a shoe on a head? And it's really Scaparelli that, that figures out uh, how to do it. What's really interesting is the suit that Scaparelli pairs this high heel hat with. Um, and so the high heel, of course, you know, we can relate it to the idea of the fetish that we talked about earlier. You can think about the way that that uh, heel sticking up in the air, um, you know, is this sort of phallic piece of the hat. Um, but the suit that it was designed to go with has these embroidered lip shaped pockets uh, on it that you can see here on the left. And I'm showing you on the right uh, a version of this suit that was produced for an American department store for Lord and Taylor that sort of plays, it's not lip shaped, but the velvet that lines those pockets, there's this interesting element of touch that is played with um, in this in this suit jacket by Scaparelli. Um, and the kind of surreal and strange idea of, you know, putting your hand in someone's mouth, um, which is enacted by these pockets. So you can see, you know, she's really underlying the surrealism of that, you know, just the idea of the high heel on the head with this suit that really pushes that um, kind of uncanny idea and that paranoia critical method, right? Misreading a pocket as a pair of lips further. One of the other collaborations with Dali was for a skeleton gown. And you can see on the left, uh, the sketch that Dali made for this gown in 1938. And then on the right, you can see the way that Scaparelli realized it with this uh, trapunto technique of creating these um, 
stuffed ridges of fabric on this tight fitting gown um, of the skeleton. And this plays with that fantasy, both of being of being able to see through clothing, right? Having X-ray vision, but instead of seeing to the you know desirable body, you see too far through, and you just get the skeleton. Um, and of course, this also um, plays in some really interesting ways um, with the sort of links between you know fashion and death, which have been. Um, exploited and played with uh, for a long time by lots of different designers. Um, and this is an image, this, the skeleton, which uh, lots of fashion designers um, have since explored um, in their collections, perhaps most notably Jean-Paul Gaultier, um, who was who was really quoting Elsa Scaparelli when, when he used this imagery. Um, but also, you know, this is just kind of on the eve of World War II, um, and so this this image of kind of a figure so emaciated that the skeleton is showing is rather haunting and kind of ghostly. And you can see it, I think, especially in the illustration by Marcel Vertes in the center of this. It's a rather disturbing kind of image. So it's interesting to note that this was not an idea that was new to Scaparelli, um, but she actually had made earlier in her career in the 1920s sweaters that had uh, skeletons uh, on them that were sort of knitted into the pattern of the fabric. And you can see what I think is one here um, from the Chicago Daily Tribune. She describes these sweaters in her autobiography. And I found this image, which I think is one of them. It sort of looks like a skeleton to me, um, but uh, it's just interesting that this is not, you know, it's not that Dali came up with the idea. Um, it's actually that it sort of rhymed with something that Scaparelli had already done earlier in her career and was then revisiting this motif. One of the other uh, collaborations in this particular 1938 collection was the Terra Illusion dress, which you can see here. Um, and that again plays with that idea of trompe l'oeil that I showed you was part of Scaparelli's very early career in the early 30s. Um, so here Dali designed this print, which has since faded from the original blue to white, um, as you see it in the, in the gown on the left. Um, but it sort of looks as though the, the dress is torn, revealing fur, and then like this sort of pink flesh underneath. So it's this very strange and ambiguous image. And you can see in this painting by Dali, one that was a, a part of his repertoire in his in his paintings that he applies to this fabric print. Um, and then the veil worn with this dress has um, a kind of um, actual cut out tear. So they're not really tears, they're like cut out. So again, this like line between what's real and what's not, this ambiguity, this engagement with the uncanny is, is very much present in a, in a design like this one. Um, and I'll just leave you with one of my favorite Scaparelli designs from uh, also from 1938, which is this dinner suit that had mirrors on it and they were placed strategically. So anyone who would ogle the breasts of the woman wearing this coat would just be confronted with their own image. So Scaparelli was constantly playing these kind of games and tricks um, and teasing viewers and also sort of um, recognizing and critiquing the ways in which women were were framed and positioned in society as it existed in, in the late 1930s. Um, and, and certainly I think a lot of these images are just as relevant now. So a surrealist who I think you should know about. Anyway, thanks so much. See you in discussion.